76 years ago today, at 7.48 a.m. Hawaii time, 353 aircraft of the Japanese Imperial Navy commenced their surprise attack upon the U.S. Pacific Naval Base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. The Battle of Pearl Harbor is one of the most well-known naval battles in history, literally the date that lives in infamy, and yet there were so many stories of that day that some are lost in the mix. The explosion aboard the magazine of the USS Arizona, which killed 1,177 of the 1,512 sailors on board, is indelibly etched upon the nation's memory. But not nearly as well remembered, but still just as heroic, was the defense of one of the battleships that was relatively lightly damaged that day. The defense of the USS Pennsylvania, thought to be the first U.S. naval vessel to return fire during the Battle of Pearl Harbor, is one of those nearly forgotten stories of December 7, 1941, and yet it is a story that deserves to be remembered. Pennsylvania, BB-38, was laid down on the 27th of October of 1913 by the Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company of Newport News, Virginia. She was the lead ship in her class, which included two ships, Pennsylvania and Arizona. The Pennsylvania class of battleships, considered super dreadnoughts, were an enlargement of the preceding Nevada class, with two more 14-inch main battery guns, greater length and displacement, four propellers, and slightly higher speed. As built, the class displaced 31,400 tons, had an overall length of 608 feet, and a beam of 97 foot 1 inch at the widest point. The four 34,000 horsepower geared turbines produced a top speed of 21 knots. The main battery included 12 14 inch 45 caliber guns, meaning that the barrel was 630 inches long, 45 times the barrel diameter, in four turrets, two each, fore and aft. The 14-inch 45 caliber gun fired an armored-piercing round that weighed a staggering 1,402 pounds, with a maximum firing range of 23,000 yards, more than 13 miles, at a 15-degree elevation, and a rate of fire of nearly two rounds a minute. When she was commissioned on the 12th of June, 1916, under the command of Captain Henry B. Wilson, Pennsylvania was one of the most advanced warships in the world. After serving in both the Atlantic and Pacific squadrons, the Pennsylvania was overhauled and modernized between 1929 and 1931. Afterwards, she was assigned to the Pacific Fleet, then called the Battle Fleet. On December 7th of 1941, she was in dry dock at Pearl Harbor, undergoing an overhaul. She was in dry dock K at Pearl Harbor. Two destroyers, the Cassin and the Downs, were in dry dock ahead of her. The cruiser Helena and mine layer Ogallala were behind her, occupying Pennsylvania's regular berth. As her boilers were down for overhaul, steam, water, and power for the ship were being provided from the dock. She had been scheduled to leave the dock on the 6th in berth at 10 dock, immediately adjacent, but delays had been encountered. Those delays probably saved the ship. On the night of Saturday, December 6th, the USS Pennsylvania's band participated in a dance night and music competition at Block Arena at the Pearl Harbor Naval Station. They played the song Georgia On My Mind and a jitterbug version of Jingle Bells. The Pennsylvania's band made the semifinals, along with the band from the USS Tennessee. The finals were scheduled for December 20th against the winners from the previous night, the band from Pennsylvania's sister ship, USS Arizona, and the band from the Marine Corps Barracks. On the morning of December 7th, a beautiful clear Hawaii day, Pennsylvania had been excused from the normal morning anti-aircraft drills because she was in dry dock. A condition watch of anti-aircraft personnel was available on board, but the guns were not manned. Because of the dry dock, the crew had to leave the ship to shower, and most were still trekking back to the ship from the port facilities at 7.57, when they started hearing the first explosions. Gunner's mate Russell Winslet, 19 years old at the time, recalled thinking that it was a strange day to hold a drill. The bombs from the first attack were already falling on Ford Island, after dry dock number one. The ship sounded the alarm for air defense, and then general quarters. Sailors rushed to their positions, many having to break the locks in the boxes to get ammunition for their guns. The first wave used many torpedo bombers. As torpedo bombers are slow and vulnerable, the Japanese wanted to use them when they could take best advantage of surprise. Torpedo planes came across the Pennsylvania from the west and the south, attacking the Helena and the Oglala, and the battleships on Battleship Row across the channel. Sometime between 8.02 and 8.05, the batteries from the Pennsylvania started firing. By many accounts, they were the first crew in the battle to open fire from their ship. The planes attacking Battleship Row were coming straight over Pennsylvania, so close that the gunners could see the pilots inside. While the dry dock protected them from torpedoes, bombers that had dropped their torpedoes came back to strafe Pennsylvania with their machine guns. The strafing was ineffective, and one of the bombers burst into flames under the anti-aircraft fire. It was difficult for the Pennsylvania's gun crews to see, as their view was blocked being below ground level in dry dock. 
but a shipyard worker was running the large dock crane along its track to try to block the path for low-flying Japanese bombers. Gunners were then able to use the location of the crane as a warning for the direction of the next attack. Nevada, to starboard, was the only battleship on Battleship Row not moored next to another battleship. That allowed her more freedom of movement, and she had managed to get underway. She was moving across Pennsylvania's starboard quarter, 600 yards off, when a dive-bombing attack came across Pennsylvania's bow, apparently intent on attacking Pennsylvania. But most of the bombers broke off, deciding to attack Nevada in the hopes of sinking her and blocking the channel. The planes that attacked Pennsylvania missed, but Nevada was hit. The damage could have been disastrous as the bomb penetrated into the forward magazine, but Nevada had been in the process of switching out her 14-inch ammunition, and the magazine was empty. The damage was bad enough, though, that Nevada was ordered to proceed to Ford Island to prevent her sinking in deeper water. She grounded near Hospital Point. At 9.06, there was another attack on Pennsylvania. A bomb struck behind one of the 5-inch guns of her secondary battery. The explosion killed 26 men, including Lieutenant Commander James Edwin Craig, the ship's executive officer. More bombs struck destroyers' downs and cast in front of them, setting them on fire. One last plane attack, coming low across Pennsylvania's bow. Machine gun bullets rammed into the shield, protecting Winslet's 50 caliber battery, but didn't penetrate. The port batteries caught the plane, which crashed into the hospital grounds. It is one of only two planes confirmed to have been killed by the Pennsylvania's batteries that day. Although observers on board claimed six kills, four were impossible to confirm. In the approximately one and a half hour combat, gunners from Pennsylvania fired nearly 61,000 rounds of ammunition. Fires continued to board cast and down, so the Navy flooded the dry dock to try to extinguish them, but some of their ordnance started to explode. Downs exploded on her starboard side, throwing a thousand pound section of torpedo tube into Pennsylvania's forecastle. The fires from the destroyers burned so hot, the paint melted off of Pennsylvania's bow. Of his sailors' actions that day, Charles Maynard Cook, captain of the Pennsylvania, said, The conduct of all officers and men was of the highest order. There was no flinching. There was no necessity of urging men to action. Rather, there was perhaps in some cases overzeal in the matter of expending ammunition. The attack on Pearl Harbor was one of the most devastating surprise attacks in U.S. history. 2,335 U.S. military personnel and 68 civilians were killed. Seven U.S. battleships and one former battleship, the USS Utah, were damaged or sunk, although all were eventually returned to service except Arizona, Oklahoma, and Utah. Nearly 350 U.S. aircraft were destroyed or damaged. Total Japanese losses were 29 aircraft destroyed and 64 dead. The cruiser Helena and the mine layer Oglala, which were at Pennsylvania's regular berth, were both heavily damaged by torpedo hits. The destroyers Cassin and Downs were both severely damaged, with their hulls destroyed, but both were salvaged and returned to service. In 1943, a Buckley-class destroyer escort was christened the USS James E. Craig in honor of Commander Craig. Craig Airport in Jacksonville, Florida, is also named in his honor. The final for the Battle of the Bands competition was never held. Among the more than 1,100 casualties of the USS Arizona was her entire band. The other bands, including the band from USS Pennsylvania, decided to give the trophy, now called the Arizona Trophy, to their fallen comrades. Pennsylvania was at sea within two weeks of the attack, returning to San Francisco for further repairs. The ship earned eight battle stars and a Navy unit accommodation, steaming a total of 146,052 miles during the war. She was known for firing so quickly that she earned the nickname Old Falling Apart because she expelled so much metal she appeared to be falling apart. During the Guam campaign, she fired more ammunition than any other warship in history during a single campaign. After the war, Pennsylvania was too old to maintain. She was decommissioned and used as a target ship during nuclear bomb testing in the Pacific. She was finally deliberately sunk in 1948 due to radiation contamination. Two of her 14-inch guns and her ship's bell are still on display in Pennsylvania today. Reminders of a history that deserves to be remembered. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs>